Hey everybody, welcome to day 37 of 100 Days of Practice. This is a follow-up to day 34. So day 34 was the first of a two-part series dealing with the second of Theo Charlier's 36 Transcendental Etudes, more fondly known simply as Charlier II. So for our purposes here, I've decided to break down the study of the etude into sections defined by the formati or pause points. So on day 34, we covered how to work from the beginning until about halfway through the fourth line which is where the first fermata is placed right before the metamorsive section. So the placement of that fermata coming as it does right in the middle of those two recitative gestures can strike people as a bit odd, and I think they're sometimes inclined to ignore it, but I think you do that at your own risk. In fact, the first piece of advice I would offer for these sections of the etude is to take advantage of each one of the fermati. I think you could argue that the first rule of efficiency is to not do unnecessary work. So specifically for us as trumpet players, this means, well, you've got a little break here, get the horn off your face for a couple of seconds. This allows you to release tension in your armature and allows for fresh blood flow. And both of these things are crucial both for short-term and long-term endurance. So at the start of this metamoso section, I don't think there are a lot of new technical challenges for the etude. However, people are inclined to miss that first low B flat for the same reason as the very first note of the piece. It's syncopated, so play it like a downbeat, and you can train for this note the same way you can for the first note of the piece. <laughs> As you may recall from day 34, this involves using the ghost tones technique, wherein you essentially play with no air, spitting the notes out almost, and then without resetting, take a good breath, see if you can get a good attack, then reset and play a normal attack and see if you can have the same feeling of connection to the instrument. But beyond that, I think the real challenges of this section are musical. Take advantage of the menomoso designation. Uh, see if you can create a real contrast from the A sections and play with a great sense of line and flow throughout. So when it comes to discussing this next section, I think I can start with a bit of a critique of my own performance. There are a few things I heard that I, I didn't like very much, and it started with that first gesture, which is supposed to serve as something of a bridge into this next section. And it should be very graceful. I felt like I was a little too aggressive and abrupt with it. And the next thing I would criticize is my handling of that wide interval, seeing the staff to the low A flat. Those are challenging, of course, but they're not supposed to sound abrupt. They're supposed to maintain the lyricism. 
So the key to making these gestures work is to A, develop your flexibility, and B, to use your flexibility and not resort to too much muscle. When it comes to avoiding using too much muscle, you're looking to keep the air steady and keep the chops stable. And this little exercise I'm about to show you, I think can be very helpful. So my next criticism of my own performance is that I didn't manage the breathing very well. I seemed to get a lot of stale air in my lungs, and by the time I got to the A-flat octaves, I was struggling a bit. And this has to do primarily with me not managing the tempo changes in a way that allowed for comfortable breathing. Sometimes you have to figure that out through experimentation. Now, despite the fact that my pacing and breathing issues left me pretty much hanging on for dear life for the time, I got to the octave slurs. I think the slurs themselves came off pretty well. But I would attribute this to training. I've worked very hard to overtrain for wider interval slurring. So my next criticism has to do with the end of that same line with the A-flat octave slurs. Those last two measures sound eh, a little squirrely, a little bit uncertain. In addition to struggling a bit at that point with the breathing and the buildup of stale air, I think the other issue is that I wasn't hearing the passage with absolute precision. So anytime I face this kind of problem, I try to make sure I can learn to play the passage on the mouthpiece. And once I have good accuracy in the mouthpiece, it's just going to pop on the trumpet. It's going to be easier, and it's going to be with a better sound throughout. Okay, so we've arrived at the last section. First of all, take advantage of that fermata. Give yourself a second or two to put the horn down, and then continue. And of course, we can expect a lot of the same challenges as we saw in the opening measures. Again, of course, there's a lot of the same challenges as the opening, making sure you play that opening F like it's a downbeat and keeping a great sense of flow, stable chops, good airflow, play as long a phrase as you can throughout. In fact, I think the only unique challenges to this section have to do with those two trills near the end. You have to make sure the pacing is good and that they develop gracefully and not too abruptly. As for that final trill, you have to decide whether to use Charlier's fingering suggestion of 1, 2, and 3 for F-sharp or to simply use second valve like you would normally. I tried both approaches and found I sounded better doing it his way. Thanks for watching. Have fun with this great etude and see you next time.